Hi, I'm Derek Hartman, a Systems Applications Engineer at Analog Devices, specifically focused on process control applications. I'm based here in Wilmington, Massachusetts in the United States. So today, first we'll be discussing field instruments. We'll have a short introduction, discuss some of the differences between loop and non-loop powered instruments, with a specific focus on loop powered instruments, we'll then discuss communications, then moving on from that, we'll discuss PLC DCS systems, brief introduction following an analog input modules and analog output modules. So what are we specifically talking about when we talk about field instruments in, in process control? If we have a process plant, we have some tank in this plant, as per this picture. This tank maybe has some sort of pressure reading. The, the field instrument will be the device measuring the press pressure and communicating that back to the PLC control module. This PLC control module will hook back up to the control room and it will also then connect to some actuator um, which will then further control the process. So a, a, a high level system level overview of this um, as I've described explained before, we have a sensor connected to our PLC. Our PLC will also maybe be connected to an actuator. In this diagram, we're controlling the flow um, based on the flow, flow sensor measurement. Um, in terms of communications protocol between the PLC and sensor actuator, um, often 4 to 20 milliamp loops could be a 0 to 10 volt connection or else some sort of field bus RS-485 type protocol. And then from the PLC back to the controller, we might have some Ethernet or else a field bus pro protocol. And then from the controller back to the operations level, it's almost exclusively Ethernet. So discussing those field instruments in, in particular, what do field instruments measure? So probably the most common by far is temperature, but they also often measure pressure, flow, level, position, and, and a number of other variables. If you can measure it, there could be a, a field transmitter to measure that, that parameter. So we'd like to split those field instruments into two broad categories. One is loop-powered instruments. These are instruments where there's a two-wire connection to the PLC, and this connection supplies both the power and the communication. Um, power is supplied over the same current loop, and the current is modulated to provide the analog data back to the PLC. The entire transmitter must operate at less than 3.2 milliamps for a standard transmitter, and the reason for that is the low alarm current of the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. There are also then non-loop powered devices. Here there is also a separate power supply from the 4 to 20 milliamp communication, um, and that's why you get this four-wire connection, two lines for power, two lines for communication. In reality, this may be three as the grounds may be shared between the two. Um, here, there's no practical power or no real power consumption limitations. And this is typically used in situations where you cannot make the device loop powered because it requires too much um, current or too much power. So moving in specifically on two-wire uh, connections. Um, here's a, a general diagram of the connection on the on the right. Um, we have a power supply. In this co case it's shown as a 24 volt supply. Um, in reality this is usually specified as greater than 12 volts. Um, this is then connected to our field instrument. This field instrument will regulate the current between 4 and 20 milliamps. This current is then fed through a sense resistor on our analog input module, which is in our PLC or our DCS. Um, and that's the, the voltage across that is then fed into an ADC to measure the loop current. One thing to note here, or just to reiterate what I said earlier, if the minimum loop current in this example we say is 4 milliamps, the minimum voltage is 12 volts. So our total available power is 12 volts by 4 milliamps is less than 50 milliamps. So we ultimately pushed into some sort of lower, low power type design, which we'll get into in the next sli few slides. So to give a, a general diagram of a, of a smart transmitter, in this case specifically a pressure transmitter, we have our sensor front end. 
This connects to some sort of analog signal conditioning to analog to digital converter. This digital data is then processed in our microcontroller, which performs cal calibration, linearization, does compensation, as well as handling another number of other functions. And then lastly, this is transmitted back to our PLC DCS, and in this case, via a 4 to 20 milliamp loop. And there may also be a peripheral, such as an LCD screen. So what are some of the key trends for these field transmitter? One is the housing is becoming smaller. This drives a need for a few things. One is smaller parts, needs for higher integration so that they're fewer parts. Also because the housings are becoming smaller, the uh, electronics may sit closer to, to maybe a hot fluid or what, depending on the, the sensor type. So this also pushes the need for higher temperature rated parts as well. Um, and in some cases, this can also lead to a need for more efficient parts to keep the power uh, generated by the electronics to a, to a lower level. There is also a trend for more processing requirements. This can be driven uh, partly by, by the need for more safety and diagnostic features. Um, this leads to the need for lower power MCU cores and also better general processing capabilities, more efficient processing capabilities. So moving specifically onto a pressure transmitter circuit, again we, we described the circuit earlier, specifically here we have a pressure, differential pressure bridge sensor, we also then have a, another bridge sensor for, for compensation, or a static pressure sensor, we also then have a temperature sensor which performs our temperature compensation. This is fed into to a multiplexer which multiplexes these three signals between our two front ends. Two front ends contain an in-amp to gain up the, sen the signals from the bridge sensors or the RTD sensor, and this is fed into a high-precision Sigma Delta ADC. Then, as before, this is fed into our MCU, which performs a calibration linearization of those pressure signals. It will also communicate with both the ADCs and output circuitry. And then, lastly, we have a 420 milliamp driver as well as any power circuitry. To fit some products to the signal chain, we have the AD779X. This is a low-power Sigma Delta core. Uh, it's a fully integrated system on, on chip and it's been used in a, in a vast number of low-power applications. So in this example, the AD779X is being used to interface to a thermocouple and also an RTD for our cold junction compensation. The AD779X contains our our bias voltages on chip as well as excitation currents. It also contains multiplexer, PGA, and high precision sigma delta ADC. One advantage of the, the sigma delta ADC architecture is we can get our 50 60 hertz rejection um, and reject our, our line frequencies. And this product is a, is a available in a no number of different variants. This product is available in a number of different variants as shown at the bottom of this slide. So then to back up again to that same signal chain, there's also the ADUC M360, which similar to the 8779X contains a complete analog front end signal chain but it also contains a low-power Precision Cortex-M3 microcontroller. So here's a block diagram of what that looks, li looks like. We have our high-precision analog front end. It's a fully uh, muxed front end with PGA and Precision 24-bit Sigma Delta converter. Then on the digital side, we have an ARM Cortex-M3 core that can run up to 16 meg megahertz has 128 kilobytes flash, 8 kilobytes RAM, uh, as well as a number of, of peripherals, an on-chip oscillator, um, to just name a few. So in terms of actual specifications, that Cortex M3 is running at about 298 microamps per megahertz. The ADC core itself is running at about 70 microamps per ADC. Um, and then we can split out all the, all the supply currents for, for the different peripherals. But to kind of come to, to a conclusion 
two to the power. Um, if we run the CPU at about 500 kilohertz, both ADCs active, both PGAs at 16, um, our total supply current will be less than one milliamp max. In terms of analog performance, um, both ADCs are 24 bit monotonic up to 500 samples per second. Um, they can achieve greater than 19 bits RMS for a uh, clock rate or a sample rate of 50 hertz. They can achieve simultaneous 50 and 60 hertz rejection at 50 samples per second. Uh, and there's an also an on chip reference. The part is specified all the way from 1.8 to 3.6 volts and is available in a 7 by 7 millimeter package. Um, lastly, it also specified from a minus 40 to 125 degree C temperature range. So here's a circuit using that device as actually a complete smart transmitter. Um, this is using the ADUCM360 to, to measure a thermocouple as well as RTD for cold junction compensation. The ADUCM360 is also used to drive an external transistor which regulates the 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. And there's one other component, uh, ADP1720 LDO, to regulate the loop voltage down to the supply of the ADUCM360. <coughs> this circuit can be found at analog.com if you search for CN0300. The hardware is available, there is a circuit node available, um, and there's also a num number of other collateral materials. So moving on to that 4 to 20 milliamp interface itself. So here's a generalized circuit of our, of our loop on transmitter. We have our two wire connection, loop in and loop out. The loop in is directed towards an LDO. This will regulate the loop voltage down to the supply required by our microcontroller, ADC and other peripherals. Then to actually regulate the current loop itself, we have a DAC output, which is driven into a current setting resistor. This voltage mode DAC across this resistor will generate the, the current reference needed for our current output. This current is then mirrored from R1 to R2 at the output. One important thing to notice here is the ground reference point on the circuit is not loop out. The ground reference point of the ADC, DAC, MCU, and all peripheral circuitry is at this point of the amplifier over here. This means that all the current used by the circuit will be summed with whatever is regulated by the FET to generate our 4 to 20 milliamp loop current. And again, that 4 to 20 milliamp loop current, it, whichever the current is, is a mirror of what we've set at our DAC output. And reiterating what we said earlier, the total supply current needs to be less than 4 milliamp. This includes all of the circuitry, and every part therefore needs to be as low power as possible. This feeds into the 854221. This is a loop powered DAC driver and voltage regulator. This operates at 300 microamps max. You can see in this plot on the top right, it has very tight error specifications. It can achieve up to 0.05% max um, total uncalibrated error. Um, in terms of the circuit diagram, we can see here there's a digital control on the left. This feeds into that DAC plus driver I just explained in the previous slide. There's also a highly flexible voltage regulator, which accepts loop voltage and can output uh, a number of different voltages based on the selection from 1.8 to 12 volts output. The other features of this part is it has a number of diagnostic features, um, such as there's an S SPI interface watchdog, there's a S SPI packet error checking, there's loop current out of range monitor, there's over temperature monitor, and there's also a power supply monitor, amongst other features. So then moving on to, to heart communication. Maybe you've heard of heart communication. What is it? Um, this is another interface that is, sits on top of the 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. Um, it 
uses a 1.2, 2.2 kilohertz FSK signal. So how this is working is a 4 to 20 milliamp loop can be considered relatively slow. So for example, anything below 25 hertz. The reason for this is a 4 to 20 milliamp loop cabling can be very long, which naturally will slow down the loop during to, due to cabling parasitics. Um, also, the process is not expected to vary very fast in a typical application. So this FSK signal allows a, a digital protocol to be added on top of the standard 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. This allows communication from the PLC or DCS to the heart-enabled instrument and from the heart-enabled instrument back. So firstly, why is this important? Well, one is this because of the industry trends. There's a need for more diagnostics, um, for asset management, uh, and just generally more communication in the plant. What, what can I know about my plant um, from the control room? What is the status of my plant? Is it healthy, um, etc.? Uh, the one limitation of the 4 to 20 milliamp interface in this area is that it's is a single direction only. So the field instrument can only con communicate back up to the PLC DCS. Um, it can only also only communicate a single value. And there's also limited diagnostics. The only real diagnostics are over or under current alarms, which don't really tell the user much except that the, the field instrument cannot be relied upon. What is heart enable? It enables a digital communication on top of the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. This means that it's compatible with all standard 4 to 20 milliamp equipment. So, for example, a heart enabled instrument can be used in a regular 4 to 20 milliamp loop without the heart protocol if it isn't available. Um, it's also widely acceptable accepted in the industry um, and recently it's been adopted more and more into the PLC DCS itself. So what solutions do ADI have to offer for this? Um, is the AD57100 heart FSK modem. Um, this is an integrated low power 0.5% precision oscillator which helps to save a lot of space has an integrated receive bandpass filter and it also has a high enough output drive to be connected to the to the heart to the loop so comparing the 85700 FSK modem to competing devices um, it has 30% 8% lower power compared to the closest competition there's a 75% footprint saving and also a reduction in external components um, so for example the package size is 4x4 four four millimeters um, the current consumption is 178 microamps with the reference enabled and it also has the industry's widest temperature range negative 40 to 125 degrees C and operates all the way down to 1.8 volt logic levels. So here's a field instrument demo that incorporates all these, these components we've measured, uh, we've just discussed. Um, there's the ADUC M360 that's interfacing to a pressure bridge sensor and RTD. This, the microcontroller is then performing all linearization and calibration. This is also controlling the 85421 DAC and loop driver um, and is also controlling the 85700 heart FSK modem. So to look at the, the power consumption of this circuit, we go back to, to our generic block diagram. What are the, the power consumptions of the circuit? The sensor itself, the resistor, it's a resistive pressure bridge and the RTD sensor are consuming about 800 microamps. Again, this could be slightly reduced or slightly de decreased depending on the application trade-offs. The heart modem is consuming about 157 microamps. The output stage um, including the LDO is consuming 225 microamps and lastly the Cortex M3 MCU with front end that's both ADCs active with buffers both PGAs in the gain of 16 the SPI UART timers watchdog and other circuitry enabled including the voltage reference and current sources 
and the core itself is running at 2 megahertz um, with the internal clock generator. And the total current you consumed is as low as 1.72 milliamps. But even with all these low power components, we can see the total is already 2.7 milliamps. So you can see, even with a, with a circuit design using state-of-the-art components, the, the power consumption challenges are still, are still prevalent, and these components help enable systems to meet their power targets. So with this board that I just mentioned, we also use this to pass um, the heart registration. This was done to give a, a high level of confidence in, our, firstly, our heart modem and the combination of our heart modem and 85421 um, loop powered device. With this board, we ran a number of tests, including the noise ring silence, analog rate of change test, and we received our heart registration for this, for this solution. Um, this as mentioned, this registration provides a level of confidence in in our components. The Heart Communications Foundation do not re register components themselves and this is why we have taken a, a systems approach. One thing to notice specifically, ADI does not provide a heart stack. Uh, the heart stack had to be present uh, to pass the heart communication certification, um, but this is not something analog devices can provide to our customers. Um, we have published um, the circuit and associated code on the uh, analog devices website, but it should be noted that this com code controls the microcontroller, the 85421 DAC, and the 857 heart modem, but it only does one heart command and not a full heart stack. Um, the heart, heart stack ranges from, or the heart, heart protocol ranges from the physical layer to the applications layer. Our demo board is demonstrating the physical layer um, and with some basic software um, to do this, do this demonstration. The Heart Communications Foundation doesn't provide a heart stack on a commercial basis either, but there are many third parties um, that provide this service, and some of them can be found from the Heart Communications Foundation website. Heart Communications Foundation's website. So then to move on to, to communications, and specifically in the context of line-powered devices, where does this fit into our system? Um, we're talking about this box in the, in the bottom right. Typically, as I say, this will fit into a line-powered system. Uh, relevant protocols are, are Profibus, CANBUS, Modbus. Um, today we'll specifically discuss that in the context of isolation and even more specifically CAN isolation. So when I discuss iPower, isopower and iCoupler devices, what, what do I mean? So to date analog devices has sold in excess of 750 million isolation channels and that's still growing. In 2001, Analog Devices released the ADUM1100, which is the first um, digit, iCoupler digital isolator. And over the years, we've, released, we've expanded this family further and further um, to include de devices that are complete solutions for, for RS-485, RS-232, and most recently, CAN protocols. So a typical CAN open node might look like this. In the top, we have our power, power isolation using a transformer driver as well as some regulation. On the secondary side, our uh, data isolation is used using done using optocouplers. This then also connects to some CAN transceiver circuitry. The limitations of the circuitry is a, is a relatively complex solution. Because of the number of components, it takes quite a bit of space. The cost of the solution can be relatively high. There also can be some reliability concerns due to optocoupler wear out. And there can also be some concerns or considerations of robustness at the actual CAN interface. 
So one solution to this is the ADM3053. As shown here, this integrates all these features um, of the previous circuitry. It has an on-chip ISO power, which provides the power isolation required. It also has data isolation on chip as well as the CAN transceiver itself. This transceiver is also um, protected against vo over voltages up to as high as 36 volts. So then moving on from, from field instruments to talk about PLC DCS systems. Where do these fit in? In a broader system con context, we're talking about these devices here in, in the control room that are connecting to the field devices. So first to talk about analog outputs and sp specifically. What are the trends in analog outputs? Firstly, the module size is getting a lot smaller. The, the knock-on effect is that the power dissipation allowed in the module also reduces. So it could have been 5 to 10 watts in the past. Maybe Currently, it's maybe 3 to 5 watts allowed in the housing, and in future, it might move to as low as 2 to 3 watts. Um, kind of fighting against that is the fact that the channel density is increasing. So this actually increases the power dissipation at the same time as allowed power dissipation is decreasing because of the smaller form factors. There's also some requirement for, for increased speed on the inputs and, both, and the outputs. And there's also some increased safety and diagnostic requirements. So this slide talks about a few different architectures um, and moves through some the evolution of some of our products. So starting on the, the left-hand side, um, for our, our current and voltage outputs, we could implement some discrete solution using um, some DAC as well as amplifiers and transistors to form our output structure. Uh, these circuits have an advantage in that they can be um, highly configurable to the exact application, but on the other hand, they're often not very flexible um, and may even require bomb changes to change between various ranges and options. You can move in, on from this architecture. There's something like the second circuit where we have uh, a quad channel DAC and here use an output driver component such as the 805750. This output driver component provides all the voltage and current output ranges, um, things like 0 to 5, 0 to 10, plus minus 5, plus minus 10, 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 20 milliamps, as well as a number of overrange options. And these can be uh, flexibly con configured by software or hardware. The advantage uh, of this solution is this is this flexibility and also uh, a guaranteed performance in package. Moving on, we get to, uh, over to the right. We have a fully integrated DAC plus driver solution, such as the AD5422. Um, one of the advantages of this is smaller size, but along with that is the fact that we can achieve higher performance because we can optically match the DAC and driver and give a out-of-box accuracy for the whole solution. Progression from this is, is to the AD5755. It, it's the first quad universal output solution. Um, it also features a, a novel feature which we'll discuss in the next slide, dynamic power control, with help, help, which helps with our power efficiency as we discussed in our trends. also has a number of diagnostics and features in, integrated. This component can also result in significant reduction in board areas, um, manage our, our heat efficiently, and will decrease time to market and cost of ownership. So here's a block diagram of the AD5755. Uh, on the left we have our, our digital circuitry as well as a number of diagnostics such as watchdog timer, there's packet area checking, um, there's uh, temperature alarms, uh, as well as a number of other functions. We also have a precision 16-bit DAC uh, per channel, um, which feeds into our voltage and current output circuitry. Uh, and also for our current output circuitry, we have this smart dynamic power control, which I'll explain now. So one of the difficulties 
in uh, a 4 to 20 milliamp output module is if we want to drive a 1 kilo ohm load, be able to drive a 1 kilo ohm load um, with 24 milliamps, we will need at least 24 volts supply to drive that. On top of that, we will need some headroom. So let's say uh, maybe 3 volts, so that we need a 27 volt supply. But on top of that, we'll also have a tolerance on that supply, which maybe pushes up to us up to a 30 volt potential supply um, to supply our current output stage. The difficulty then comes is if our load is instead of one kilo ohm, it's very low. Some ADC input modules could have um, loads as low as 20 ohms, or we could consider that pretty much a short zero ohm load. If we drive 24 milliamps into a zero ohm load with a 30 volt supply, we will have to drop um, our 30 volts at 24 milliamps across our output driver. Um, so if we have uh, 30 volts of 24 milliamps, um, we'll get 0.72 watts dissipated on our part, which is, as you can hear, a lot of power. And acro that across eight channels, um, plus some, some efficiencies of, of generating a high voltage supply, um, we would be in the region of 6 watts for, for our 8-channel module, just purely based on the analog output circuitry and nothing else. This clearly violates the 5-watt watt target. So dynamic power control is a solution to this, and the way this is achieved is we use a 5-volt supply and a DC-DC boost converter. This boost converter regulates the supply to our current output stage depending on the, the load present or the, the voltage requirements at, at the actual I out pin. So if, for example, we have a zero ohm load and we want to drive 24 milliamps, the DC-DC in this case will regulate to a minimum of about 7.5 volts. But in the case where we have a one kilo ohm load and want to still drive 24 milliamps, the DC-DC will regulate up to somewhere in the region of 27 volts to supply the, the current and required at the output. Um, if we do our, our, our calculation on this, we can find that for an 8-channel module, um, we can consume roughly three, mo 3 watts just on the output stage, and this clearly uh, pushes us into to a space where we could meet the, the power targets um, we mentioned in the trends. So then mov moving on to the analog inputs. Um, trends for analog inputs are higher speed and performance, um, ADC cores. This is also for, for channel multiplexing, for higher multiplexing rates. Better robustness includes 50-60 hertz rejection and also over voltage protection. So what are PLC inputs measuring? So we could have so voltage inputs, maybe 0 to 10 volts. This could be as simple uh, as a potentiometer from a, from a valve could have 20 milliamp, 4 to 20 milliamp inputs from our smart transmitter, or we could have temperature and thermocouple type inputs. One part that can be used for, for these applications is the 87176. It's 24 bit, 250 kilo samples per second sigma delta ADC. It can achieve as much as 17.2 noise free bits at 250 kilo samples per second. One thing to note here as well is that the high channel switching rate is possible. It's possible to achieve the 17.2 bits at 50 kilo sample per second channel switching rate, and that's fully set settled per, per sample. So why the need for the speed? So one example is in robotics and set point control. Here we have a a closed loop system, we have field instrument, 4 to 20 milliamp to our IO module, and then 4 to 20 milliamp to our actuator. Now the speed of the system depends on how fast we can close this loop. So if we can settle this faster, this leads to higher productivity, higher efficiency, and better control of our system. So the table on this slide shows various output data rates and the resolution that can be achieved at these data rates. 
The other important piece of information circled in red here is also the channel switching rates that can be achieved. Um, this is for a SYNC5 plus SYNC1 filter, which is a filter optimized for these high um, data and switching rates. Um, the AD7176-2 also has the regular SYNC3 and SYNC4 filters available. Um, so an example here for a channel switching rate of 50 samples per second, we can achieve 17.2 bit resolution. But if we decrease this down to something like 10 samples per second and a data rate of 10 samples per second, we can get a 19.2 bit resolution. So moving on to look at the standard SYNC3 profile, the, the SYNC5 plus SYNC1 can be used down to, to the low da data rates, but at the, the lowest da data rates, the maximum performance um, isn't as good as with a, a regular SYNC3 filter. So for, the, for a regular filter with 50-60 hertz rejection at 16.67 hertz, we can achieve 23.5 bits uh, noise-free resolution. Um, we can also increase the output data rate and maintain the 50-60 Hz rejection and achieve a cha ch channel switching rate of 27.27 um, .27 Hz, um, still with an, an impressive 23.3 bits noise-free free resolution. The one drawback is, of this is that the 50 and 60 Hz rejection is slightly lower at only 47 dB compared to 90 dB at 16.67 Hz. So this an, allows the ability to trade off data rate versus the 50-60 hertz rejection profile. The last thing to mention is, is over voltage protection of uh, analog inputs. Often PLC or DCS input modules uh, require over voltage protection. <coughs> Often P PLC DCS inputs require over voltage protection. Oh, sorry, I just clicked the pen. Um, often PLC DCS input modules require over voltage protection. This is to protect against miswiring. So in this case, uh, the supply voltage could be connected to the, the analog input terminal. And there are a number of methods uh, that could be used to protect against this. One is simply using some current limiting resistance followed by the ESD protection diodes of the device. The obvious advantage of this is that it's a cheap solution, but the disadvantage of it is it's not necessarily that robust, as often the current cap carrying capabilities of the internal diodes may not be, be fully specified, and also the current car carrying limits could be relatively low. One solution to this is to use external diodes for protection. Um, such as the second example here. Um, the advantage of this is, again, it's, it's a relatively cheap solution. The disadvantage of this up-down diode configuration is it's not necessarily suitable for um, very high-precision applications. This is due to the variable leakage current of these diodes, um, or there's also variable capacitance, um, which can affect the higher frequency components. And this can all lead to increases in non-linearity, um, and lastly, uh, there's an obvious need for these components in the circuit. One solution to this, uh, or another solution to this, is to use a di differential diode protection. The advantage of this is the leakage and current and the capacitance are constant, unlike the previous circuit. Um, again, it's a relatively cheap solution. The disadvantage of, of this solution is it will not work when the circuit is powered off. Uh, the, the solution always also requires a large R limit resistance um, in, in most configurations, and this will add noise to the system as, as well as errors due to leakage currents. The last solo solution shown, which I'll outline further in the next slide, is uh, analog devices over voltage protection solutions, such as the ADA4096 amplifier. This is integrated over voltage protection. Um, this provides most, if not all, the protection needed while powered and unpowered. Uh, it also saves board area and there's a defined output behavior during that over voltage condition. The one disadvantage can be uh, is if the, 
the over voltage protection requirements exceed the ADA 4096 um, abilities, in which case additional external protection will be required. So here the slide shows you in the top right the ADA 4096 during an over voltage event. The supplies here are plus minus 15 volt supplies and the output in red there will be clamped to those supplies during the over voltage condition. This over voltage protection is 32 volts beyond the rails. So with a 15 volt supply that's plus 47 volts, minus 47 volts. This also means when unpowered the device is still protected to plus minus 32 volts. The amplifier itself has two times the bandwidth, half the offset, lower drift, and the closest competition. So in conclusion, um, what have we covered? We've given some introduction to industrial control. We've also discussed field instruments um, and PLC DCS uh, input and output modules. We've discussed some of the mar market trends um, smaller form factors, higher efficiencies, um, as well as ADI products to support this. Um, one last thing to mention, we have a number of um, circuit notes and, and collateral available. Um, these next two slides, which are also available for download, um, I list some of the transmitter and PLC DCS circuits available um, for evaluation purposes. Thank you.